Now, I should explain that um, I'm actually a physicist. I'm not a psychologist or a philosopher or a parapsychologist. Um, but I'm very, very interested in the problem of mind and the problem of time. And um, I want to start off, though, because I am a physicist, I want to start off by describing the great triumph of physics in describing the physical universe. Um, and I'll do this very briefly, and some of you may know all about this. This is my favorite picture. This is the cosmic Euroborus, the, sna the snake eating its own tail. Um, but it has a special form because what I've done around this is I've um, put all the various scales of objects which exist in the universe. So at the bottom you've got people. If you go to, right, to the right, you've got bigger things like mountains and planets and stars and galaxies and the universe. If you go to the left, you've got smaller things like ants and, and amoebas and, and DNA and atoms and nuclei and all sorts of um, funny exotic dark particles. So this picture describes the whole range of things that exist in the universe on the microscopic and the macroscopic level. And the, the re I'm actually a cosmologist, and, and what's so significant about the head meeting the tail is that at the Big Bang, and, and everybody really now believes the universe began with a Big Bang, the very large and a very small merge. And you can think of that as because when you look to ever larger distances in astronomy, you're looking back in time, and so when you look as far as you can see, you're actually looking back right back to the beginning of the universe when the universe was very small. So to me, this is, uh, depicts the, summarizes, if you like, what we know about the universe from physics. And let me just go through this in a little bit um, more detail because actually the history of science really is one in which you're expanding consciousness uh, to ever larger and smaller scales. Well, I know at this meeting you will hear, hear a lot about expanding consciousness. But I'm talking about expanding consciousness in, in a rather intellectual way. Um, so let's give a very brief history of the, of the physics. As we expanded our consciousness with telescopes to larger scales, we, we went through a series of paradigm shifts. So, of course, we started off with the geocentric view, where the Earth was the center of the universe. Um, then we discovered that the sun, her, the sun, the colors are very bad on this picture of mine. We discovered that the, the sun actually was the center of the universe. Um, then we discovered that actually the sun is just one of hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy. So the galaxy was the center of the universe. We're now at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, now we realize our galaxy is just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. And those are the galaxies looking back to the, the Big Bang of 12. <coughs> Um, now, and uh, as, as David kindly said in introducing me, we now think that actually our universe, that's to say the region we can see, light can only travel 10,000 billion light years since the Big Bang, but there are other universes outside that, so um, there are actually uh, many, many other universes as well. But then on the, uh, the inner journey, um, to smaller scales with microscopes and things, <coughs> particle accelerators. We discover that there are atoms, and not only that, we discover the wonderful connection between the micro and the macro domains. So, for example, the same electric force which keeps the electron in orbit around a proton is what gives the structure to solid objects. We discovered uh, atoms have got nuclei, which are associated with various forces that weaken the strong force. And the thing about the weak and the strong force is that they, they hold the nuclei together, in, in, in the, the protons and neutrons together in, in the nuclei, but also they actually, for example, produce all the energy that comes from the sun. And so, again, you, that's why we're here, because of the energy coming from the sun. Um, there's an atomic explosion, not all the benefits are positive, but we do depend upon atomic power because of the sun. Um, and then they're more complicated as you um, go to smaller and smaller scales. We dif discover that the weak and the electric forces are sort of merged in electroweak force. This is the so-called standard model of particle physics. You know just last year they discovered the God particle, the Higgs particle, in this the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and then, although we can't detect them, as we get to smaller and smaller scales, there should be other objects as well, supersymmetry particles and things like that. Um, it's called the Grand Unified Theory, G-U-T, which unifies weak and electric and strong forces. And then the ultimate idea is that we have M-theory, which is going to explain everything, uh, involving ideas of strings. Uh, M, it, it might stand for 
mother, it might stand for matrix, it might stand for a mystery. We don't really know what it stands for, but a lot of people work on it. Now, so that's our, our theory of, uh, and that's the, the picture of the world we've got from physics. And it really is a beautiful picture. Because everything we know about the universe is unified in one diagram like that. And it's, it represents the sort of lawfulness and the unity of the universe. And really discovering that has been a great triumph. Um, and uh, so, uh, as I said before, it, it all merges in the Big Bang the, where the head meets the tail. And, uh, and people talk about us being on the verge of a theory of everything which will describe the whole world. <coughs> However, I want to actually, although in some sense I'm very proud of this, I want to actually, um, here's the crown of physics with M theory and the multiverse. However, there is something slightly worrying here. There is something missing. Um, and uh, there's a missing jewel, and the missing jewel is mind. There is no reference in, in these uni wonderful unified theories of physics to actually <coughs> the most basic phenomena of our experience, the existence of mind. And uh, to put this another way, um, if you look at the, the bottom of that diagram, we have human beings and brains. Uh, in, the, in the middle, in the bottom there, you've got the area of complexity. Well, the brain, in some sense, is the culmination of complexity. It's the most complex thing we know in the universe. Um, and yet, and that's the culmination, in other words, of what science has explained. And yet, it's a bit odd, because if you ask most mainstream scientists, um, they will say, well, actually, consciousness doesn't play any intrinsic role in the universe. It is just uh, the excretion of all our neurons. I mean, most neuroscientists will, will take that view, and uh, maybe... Uh, Cathy, I don't know, but she can say, but uh, certainly most physicists take that view. Um, uh, mind plays a purely passive role in the universe. Uh, we, of course, observe the universe, but, but we can't do anything about it. We're basically just machines. This is the, the standard reductionist materialist view. And so, of course, anything to do with religion and spirituality and mystical insights, such as you might obtain through uh, all these drugs, are just illusions. Well, uh, this is sort of uh, rather depressing. Um, this, is the, uh, this is a quote from uh, Weinberg. The more we, the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. This is the, uh, you know, Snoopy, you are of no importance. Did you know that you are only the tiniest speck in an enormous universe? Then I might as well go back to sleep. So really, the, the wonderful view we have of the universe intellectually has come at a price and that we really seem to be very insignificant. Obviously completely insignificant in scale, but also rather insignificant in terms of our role. We seem to be just accidents. Um, here are some illustrations of this. Uh, John Watson, who was a psychologist, the time seems to have come when psychology must discard all references to consciousness, when it need no longer delude itself into thinking that it is making mental states the objects of observation. Now, here's a psychologist, the behaviorist, of course saying we shouldn't think about consciousness. Um, Daniel Dennett, a philosopher, consciousness appears to be the last bastion of occult properties. Epiphenomena and immeasurably, immeasurable subjective states, in short, the one area of mind best left to philosophers who are welcome to it. Let them make fools of themselves trying to corral the quicksilver of phenomenology into a respectable theory. So from this perspective, Consciousness is pretty irrelevant. And most physicists tend to take that view too. Most physicists say they won't deny consciousness exists, but they will say it's nothing we can deal with with physics. Okay, because physics deals with the outside world, objective things, not with the subjective world. But not all physicists think like that. Um, and here are some who took a different view. Wigner, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, it's not possible to formulate the laws of physics in a fully consistent way without reference to the consciousness of the observer. Wheeler, John Wheeler, mind and universe are complementary. Bernard Despagne, the doctrine that the world is made up of objects whose existence is independent of human consciousness turns out to be in conflict with quantum mechanics and with the facts established by experiments. Noam Chomsky, who's a, 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 a linguist, but very clever one, the physics must expand to explain mental experiences, and, and Roger Penrose, we need a revolution in physics on the scale of quantum theory and relativity before we can understand mind. 
So what I'm saying is that although most physicists are not very interested in consciousness and mind, there are some <laughs> exceptions and some very influential exceptions. And, and I put myself in this, this camp. And that's one of the messages I want to get across in this talk, that you need consciousness. Mind is fundamental. And that's summarized in this next picture. Um, my main message, mind is a fundamental, not an incidental, um, not incidental to the universe. Now, there are all sorts of contexts in which this uh, idea has support. Um, many years ago, I was working on the anthropic principle, which says there seem to be fine tunings in the physical universe which are required for, for us, for our consciousness to be here. When in those days, 30 years ago, 34 years, 40 years ago, it was a very heretical concept, but now it's really quite popular. Um, quantum theory. Um, the most obvious way in which mind seems to come into physics is through quantum theory. And most of those people who I quoted in the last slide were quantum physicists. In some strange way, quantum theory seems to bring in consciousness and mind. Um, Paranormal phenomena, I'm not going to talk about that, but I know that uh, David, where's David gone? <laughs> he has to be here, he's in charge. Anyway, <laughs> David, who is everywhere, is, um, <laughs> has said a bit about parapsychology, and I know there must be other talks about parapsychology, but I just want to say why I think Psy is so important is because he shows us a direct interaction between the mind and the physical world. Okay, if I look at Serena and she is raised to the ceiling by my mind, I'm having an influence on the physical system. And so that's Could you the let great. Me down, hmm? Could you let yeah. Me down? I have already. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but the other, the last point is where it really comes in is in the experience of time, and that, of course, is why it relates to this to this session. Now, let me. Um, I have to say a little bit about the world view. Um, of physics, but I'm trying not to make this to. Ah, oh, David, you returned. No, no, no. I, 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 and uh, no, I just, I just invoked you, but you. Oh. Um, anyway, uh, of course, most of us, our view of the world is the Newtonian view, um, in which you have a three-dimensional space, um, and you have time. Time is is the. The time is wrong there. I'm sorry about that. But but for Newton, time was like a universal river, which. Um, flowed at the same rate for everybody. And that was the view of classical physics which really prevailed for um, 300 years. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, at the beginning of this, uh, of the last century, um, Einstein showed that the world wasn't like that at all. It's really four-dimensional. Um, I'll try not to get too technical, but so if you think of your space, three-dimensional space as a slice, um, Newton's view of time was that you, uh, as time goes on, you've got a succession of three-dimensional slices. Well, Einstein showed that, of course, space and time are merged together as four-dimensional space-time. In other words, different observers will have different um, space and time axes, and as Serena said, they, if they move in different ways, they'll experience different lengths of time between, between their meetings. Now that's all a little bit complicated, so let me just draw that as a summary of the, the Einstein view. It's, it, it's just a, a network, if you like, a mesh of clocks and, and rulers. Um, and so in this picture, time is a fourth dimension. So we're talking about time, and time is this fourth dimension. And that was the idea that Einstein brought in. And uh, a nice way, I mean, an obvious way to see this, it's a bit hard to see because of the color scheme. Anyway, you imagine you've got space and time. If you are stationary, you're just represented by a world line which is moving straight up. If you're moving with some speed, the, the, the world line is inclined, so that as, you, as time moves up, the, the position changes. If you're a photon, you travel at four to five degrees. Can you see the yellow there at all? No. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's, it's not meant to be yellow at all. Never mind. Um, but the problem about this is that actually the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics says you can't measure both position and speed simultaneously. Okay, you, if you, you can know someone's position, but you can't know how fast they're moving. Or you can know how fast they're moving, but you can't say where they are. But that is completely incompatible with this whole idea of a world line. Because a world line says you know where the particle is and you know the speed at which it's going. So quantum theory 
is fundamentally incompatible with relativity. So our two great theories of the universe, our theories of the macro domain, which is relativity, and the theory of the micro domain, which is relativity, which is quantum theory, don't actually merge together. Now, uh, so what does quantum theory say? Well, uh, quantum theory says that um, why it doesn't merge is because it has the strange concept of things like entanglement. And I'm sure you've heard uh, quite a lot about entanglement, where you have two, uh, you, you might have two objects which are, uh, uh, dec decay into two and go off in different directions. The idea is that you find that there is, uh, if you know the state of the object on the right, you know the state of the object on the left, even though it violates the normal concept of causality. And so this is the idea of what they call non-locality. Um, and in some sense, the space the idea of space, which is fundamental to relativity, is, is, is transcendent. Since then, there's been a lot of interest in what can be entangled. It, they, obviously, this was discovered for elementary particles, but it was found that it sort of applied to bigger and bigger things. And, it, you know, if you read things like uh, Dean Radin, you have the idea that, well, maybe the whole universe is entangled in some sense. And, and maybe uh, what would experience be like in that holistic medium? And so a lot of people think quantum theory is actually what's going to explain the presence of mind. I don't think that's the answer. I don't think it's the full answer, um, but I do think it's part of the answer. I don't think it's the full answer because um, no one understands quantum theory anyway, so you can't just say you've explained. You're just replacing one mystery by another mystery. Um, but I like to summarize it like this. Um, here is the, my Euroboros picture again. Um, Here's the quantum theory on the left and relativity theory on the right um, in the micro and macro domains. Now, the great challenge in physics is to merge relativity theory and quantum theory. And, and the question I would like to ask is that will the marriage of quantum theory and relativity itself accommodate mind? And that is actually, and this is a sort of idea that Penrose says, and that is my particular view. My particular view is that you're, you need some paradigm of physics, which in some sense incorporates both relativity theory and quantum theory. Um, and in some sense, that will then, if you like, give an escape from the matter-centric view. You remember I started off talking about the progression of paradigms from geocentric to um, heliocentric to galactocentric, etc. Well, maybe we need um, a view which in some sense escapes from the matter-centric view. Now, um, and, and one of the things you, I wanted to get across from that um, first discussion about the, the history of science is that as the history of science is really exploring ever wider domains of space, and as, as you do that, you sort of have a growing map of reality. And so to me, uh, modern physics suggests that there, there are in fact other types of spaces and, and in some sense other levels of reality beyond the, the common sense sort of physical reality of, of three dimensions. Um, now, um, I want to say something which is going to be a bit, I'll give, it's a little bit technical, but it's the idea of higher dimensions. Because in my own particular approach, higher dimensions play a crucial role in, the, in, this, in this attempt to unify matter and mind. So let me just do this uh, very quickly. If you're not used, some of you will probably find even four dimensions rather difficult, so obviously five dimensions is even more difficult. But let me just try and get uh, the, the basic idea across. Um, in the 1920s, Kaluza Klein said there had to be an extra dimension, a fifth dimension, which in some sense unified gravity and electromagnetism. Now, you can't actually see the fifth dimension because it's wrapped up really very, very small. So it's, it's rather like a host pipe in which the cross-section of the host pipe um, corresponds to the extra dimension. The extra dimension is, is wrapped up so small that you don't see it. Um, now, at the time, that was regarded as rather bizarre, but then in the, in the uh, 84, super strings came along, and, and then it was routine to invoke all these extra dimensions. In superstring, you have 10 extra dimensions, but all wrapped up. In M-theory, you have 11 dimensions. Um, um, and so, in some sense, uh, the history of physics might be thought of as a history of increasing dimensionality. Um, and so, this is the, uh, 
shows how you go from the three-dimensional to the four-dimensional to the five-dimensional to the ten-dimensional to the eleven-dimensional view. And a particularly nice picture, which is popular at the moment, is, is the so-called random syndrome picture, in which our physical universe is called a brain, B-R-A-N-E, in this higher dimensional bulb, with, which has got the extra dimension, the fifth dimension. And, and of course, this is, goes beyond our normal experience and maybe our normal comprehension. But the point is that in s the reality that physics reveals is, uh, in some sense, increasingly remote from common sense reality. But nevertheless, that's the price we pay for this, this wonderful unification. Now, um, but now I want to talk about time, which, is, of course, is what the main purpose of this meeting is. Now, there's actually a fundamental problem with time from a physics perspective. I told you about world lines, so you can think of this space-time diagram, and, and you can think of the line of your brain as corresponding to that inclined line. And we have this experience that as we, of the flowing of time. So, if you like, um, the point here, you can think of it as like a bee going along, going along the, the wire of your brain's world line. So, for example, now it's uh, 12, oh my goodness, it's 12.25, um, and uh, that, that's that point there, but it was 11.25 an hour ago, and it's 1.25 an hour in the future. And the really weird thing is that in physics, there is no way of actually describing that. And another idea is that you have the idea that at a particular moment in time, you can make a choice. You can decide whether to come to this lecture or go to another lecture, and, and in some sense, you have this feeling that you are making a decision and choosing one of these lines. But again, within relativity, that actually is meaningless. You can't even describe that process, because all that exists in the Einstein block universe of the past, the present, and the future. They, they coexist. You cannot describe consciousness in, with reference to relativity theory. And historically, the way some people have tried to get around this is to say you need some extra dimension or some extra time which is relating to the physical, your, your mental experience. So, for example, um, how do I explain the motion of this, this, this bead along the world line of the brain? Well, I imagine that each of these S's corresponds to space-time, and, and there's the line, and I make a decision. It corresponds to making one of these um, uh, choices. And so I've got a sequence of uh, uh, choices like that. And in some sense, you need an extra dimension, which, if you like, is it corresponds to a higher uh, time. This is a, quite, a, quite an old idea. And, but what is interesting is that this, it isn't, this is not mainstream physics, but nevertheless, it, it's the idea that goes back to C.D. Broad and people like that. The idea is that you need something to explain consciousness, because consciousness itself is not explicable in relativity. And, and something I'm interested in, uh, I relate this, and for example, if you want any model of precognition, I mean, uh, David, David, there he is again. David was referring to precognition in his, his experiments. If you believe in precognition, you have to have some model like this for it to make sense. Now, the um, one interesting thing is, in my own approach, I relate this to the, um, the, the brain bulk picture. Because remember that in that higher dimensional picture, which comes from conventional physics, you're, the physical world is a brain moving in the fifth dimension. And I relate that because I relate this extra dimension to the, the extra dimension of time. Again, not a mainstream uh, physics view, but it's the one I particularly like myself. The motion of the brain through the bulk, in some sense, corresponds to this. But now I want to come to the second point about time. As this is the concept of specious present. Now, there's been a lot of talk. I don't know if the word specious present has arisen so far, but there's been a lot of implicit discussion about it. Um, the idea of the specious present, it goes back to William James, it's the idea that it's like a minimum time scale of experience, okay, which for human beings is something like a tenth of a second or something like that. I mean, they're different definitions. It depends on the context in which you're talking. But generally speaking, there's a minimum time of which we can be aware. I mean, it's less than that. It's, it's subliminal. And for most of us in a normal state of consciousness, it, it's, it's something like a order or a second or a tenth of a second. So if it's a time scale smaller than that, you can't consciously perceive it. The body might at some level perceive it, but your consciousness can't. 
But what's particularly fascinating is the way in which the species present can vary. And we heard a lot of, we heard something about this from Kathy. 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 Um, sorry, well, thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Now, uh, so I'm going to go over the. Um, I must say, I, I know much less about this than Kathy does, which is why I was so interested in your talk. But let me just summarize the things I've been interested in. For example, um, a trapeze artist. A trapeze artist, he has to decrease his species present. Okay, because that, that means that the time goes slower because you're decreasing the species present. So time seems to go slower because he has to catch the hand of the person. On the other hand, a balance artist, um, he has to increase his species present so that uh, we think he's, he's standing there static for a minute, but for him, for, for 10 seconds, for a minute, but for him it only seems like 10 seconds. Um, uh, Kathy referred to the crisis situation. You're in a car accident and time slows down. Um, there's the opposite case. You, uh, there's a case of someone who has a fever and is lying in bed and notices this flashing light at the window um, and eventually realizes it's actually the sun rising and setting. But uh, his time perception has changed, so what is arising, what seems to take 24 hours, is very, very rapid. Now, moving into more exotic things, uh, near-death experiences. Well, I'm sure you all know about near-death experiences. One of the interesting aspects of near-death experiences is that you enter the light sometimes, and you have a life review in which your whole life more or less appears instantaneously. So that's a situation in which your, your species present increases. But actually, uh, and, and there's the person entering the light, um, Tea time, now this isn't a break, a, a hint that we should break for coffee. I'm making a particular reference here to um, a poem of um, Rupert Brooke, where he had a sort of mystical experience in which he was in a room with his, his lover and he was pouring the tea and suddenly it froze. I've even got the poem, but I don't think I can read it out. But let me just say, um, I, I'm running out of time. So I won't, uh, shall I? So I won't read it out, but basically what happens in this poem is that he describes how he's pouring the tea for his lover. Suddenly it freezes, and in that moment, time ceases to exist. And, and of course, he puts it in much more beautiful ways than I can put it, which maybe I'll come back to that afterwards if someone asks me. But, I mean, but then, eventually, alas, time begins to, to flow again. Um, and then mystical experience. Now, there hasn't been so much reference the mystical experience, but um, this is a, a, a quote from Kelly. There is an interesting similarity between the description of mystical state, mystical experiences produced through the stages of Samadhi characterized Pantajali and an early anatomist twisting the focus of a microscope. It's as though the meditator is adjusting the focal length of his mind and encountering systematically different worlds depending on the, the settings achieved. Um, I'm not an expert on these, I certainly haven't experienced such things, um, but, uh, but it's, to me, very interesting. It's as though you are actually can tune experience in the world in a different frequency band. And uh, it's as though, in other words, you have a change of species present. And in, in the mystical situation, there seem to be two distinct states, and someone here can correct me. Um, there's the situation where all that exists is the present, which is a huge contraction of the species present. And the cosmic consciousness, where the whole history of the universe, billions of years, exists instantaneously. So again, those are the two extreme situations. And it's possible that there's pure consciousness, in some sense, what's called perusa, may transcend space and time altogether. Now, of course, what's really interesting to this, to this group is what happens in psychedelics. And we had a reference to, to that um, earlier about, um, I forgot his name now, but... What a similar, well, sorry, I'll come back to that later. Um, there isn't a later. Um, now, of course, the question is, what does this correspond to in the brain? I mean, presumably, there is something, there is some internal clock. There's my space-time diagram. Here's the external clock, and there's the internal clock, depending on something in the brain. And I'm not an expert on that, but presumably, Kathy can, can explain uh, what that is. But, but nevertheless, the point is to me, Oh, there, there she is. To me, that is the, uh, the interesting question. What happens in the brain when people change their species present? But however, let me just give a little example. Consciousness of the... David, I'm going over... Yeah, out of time.
Let me just quickly finish with this little, can I do my little simulation? Um, the point I want to make is that consciousness only exists between um, an upper and lower limit. So here, if you like, is our little clock going around, and you can see our little light going around, and you can read it. As it goes faster, you can see it. It's going faster. But when it goes too fast, you can't see it, because it's going around, the time scale is, is actually less than the species present. So in some sense, time has become space. On the other hand, if I now let it go down, if I let it now move more slowly, you can see it, it gets rather boring. And in fact, if it goes too slowly, like the time is 100 years, it doesn't seem to move at all. So time, our experience of time, only exists within a narrow window between about a second and 100 years. And I think that's telling us something very important. And, uh, and, and I think the interesting question is, we assume that the specious present, the only level of consciousness, has to correspond to our experience of the world, where the specious presence is a second. But I would put to you that there may be other modes of experiencing the universe which have a very different specious present. So the human I put as 10 to the minus 2 seconds, maybe there's a sort of terrestrial level of consciousness with a time scale of 10 to the 5th seconds, a galactic scale of consciousness with 10 to the 16 seconds, even a cosmic scale of consciousness with 10 to the 17 seconds, which is like a billion years. And so I, I think I'm, I'm going to go, I'm just going to close your eyes, I'm going to skip these. Uh, um, this, is, this was some discussion of uh, direct evidence for, let me just um, talk about the, no, I've got, I've got to finish. Let, but is this just, let me go, I'm going to go straight to the end because otherwise I'm going to. These were some experiences from near-death experiences, which I'm not going to read because I'm going into discussion time, but you can ask me later if you like during the discussion. But these are people who've experienced the transcendence of space and time. Let me just finish by saying that, to me, matter and mind, we need to link them in some way. And to me, time, and indeed higher dimensions, are crucial to that link. Because to me, these, the, these specious presence actually correspond to the sort of a hierarchy of, of, of time, a hierarchy of sort of closed time dimensions. And so uh, it is time to end, so I finish now. Sorry to overshoot. Thank you.